All right, this is section 12.5. Um, essentially, the section is called Tangents and Normals to Curves. But a better subtitle might be sort of the thing that the, that the section finishes with, which is uh, Tangential and Normal Components of Acceleration. Now that may seem a bit vague about what we mean by that, and that's all right right now. So what we'll do is we'll set like, um, let me call this number one, we'll set sort of an initial sub goal. Is this, is that given a curve uh, in say two dimensional space or three dimensional space, we'd like to get a hold of two unit vectors. Um, one of them needs to be tangent to the curve. One of them needs to be perpendicular to the curve. In fact, we'll say given a parameterization, R of T. The sub goal, if you like, or let's say the goal for now uh, is to obtain two vectors. Uh, let's say two unit vectors to be precise. One tangent to the curve. And one perpendicular. I'll say normal. That's like with normal plane, uh, normal vectors to plane. So normal meaning perpendicular here. So visually, this is what we're looking for. And this is a two dimensional picture, but you can picture this sort of thing in three dimensions as well. So you've got this curve. This is the curve with the parameterization. You've got a specific point right here. And the goal is to obtain two vectors. One will be a unit vector perpendicular. Let's assume for the sake of argument that the, uh, the curve is going this way. And the other will be a normal vector, which will be perpendicular, so let's say this way. I'm not gonna argue right now whether we want facing in or facing out. In three dimensions, this, uh, you know, this, this perpendicular vector could be lots of different directions sort of wrapped around if you think this in three dimensions. But for right now, just we visually see that these two form a right angle. One of them is tangent and the other one is perpendicular. So the big question is like, how could we obtain these? So one of these is really easy. So number two, we'll say the tangent vector. I wanna be cautious here to make sure that we're clear that what we're talking about is, is the tangent vector, right? Like you could say that a vector is tangent, as it's like a property of the vector, but this is talking about a very specific vector. Right? So the tangent vector, the obvious thing to do is we know that the velocity vector points in the correct direction. It is tangent to the curve. It may not be a unit vector, so we can make it a unit vector simply by dividing by its length. Right? So this is very simple. We take uh, the velocity vector. Remember the velocity is r prime of t. and make it a unit vector. So this leads us to a nice easy definition. We'll say the tangent vector I'll underline the the as well. This is denoted with a capital T bar of T. So very simple. We take R prime and we divide by its magnitude. That's it. So we'll do an example in a second. There's no reason to uh, to work through one right now. Um, very simple. Take the velocity vector, divide by its magnitude. You get the goal. So the next question is, how do we get the normal vector? So let's have sort of a brief discussion about how we could obtain this.
So one idea might be something like the following. So I'm going to suggest an idea and then we'll look at why it doesn't work. And then we'll sort of suggest what, what might be a good alternative. And then we'll show that the alternative does work, right? So one idea is which fails, if you like, is what about maybe the acceleration vector? Right? Let me not use A, let me use a R double prime. Right. So the problem is this fails to work. I'm going to immediately put a big red line through it just so you're not convinced to write this down and take it as a formula. This fails to work. So the big question is, which will be helpful to look at, is why does it fail to work? And knowing why it fails to work will help us see what might work. Right? So if you remember what the, the, uh, the acceleration vector does, right? the acceleration vector captures two notions. It captures the notion of a change in direction, but also a change in velocity. So when we drew the acceleration vector, let me clear the left side of the screen and draw an example picture just so you can sort of see what I'm saying here. All right, so this is question about why does it fail to work? So the thing to remember is, let, let's look at a picture, right? Here is a picture of an acceleration vector. It's just an example. I'm not gonna write down a function or anything like that. Just something to sort of digest. So you could have like a velocity, or you could have a, an object traveling here. It's going this way. You have a specific point right here. We have an acceleration vector, oh sorry, a, a tangent vector, which will look like this. Now the acceleration vector typically will not be perpendicular. It will look something like this. Not necessarily, it could point backwards in fact, but this would be a typical A of t, i.e. if you prefer R double prime of t. So the point is, the reason for this is it's got like a, a component, it's sort of pointing partly in the green direction right? and partly perpendicular. So A of T is partly um, in the green direction, in uh, let's say in V's direction. This is V right here. This is because A of T captures the change in speed. As well as the change in direction. So if we want to get rid of the part that's going in V's direction, like abstractly, this makes us think, well, can we get rid of the can we not care about the speed, right? So how can we measure just the change in direction? And again, this is all very sort of fluid and abstract. And so what we'll do is we'll suggest a formula and then we'll actually prove that it does the job. So how can we measure only the change in direction? So then we have this aha moment. We go, well, what tells us direction without worrying about speed, right? Well, this T that we just wrote, right? This gives direction. Because it's a unit vector, there's no real speed about it, right? This is, gives direction without regard for speed. So this gives us the following idea. What if we just looked at t prime and then made it a unit vector? So it turns out this is what happens. So here's the definition. What we'll do is we'll define, um, again, this will be the normal vector. Is, this is capital N of t. What we'll do is we'll take the derivative of t, the t we just found, the tangent vector. Now, t is a unit vector, but its derivative may not be. So what we'll do is we'll take t and we'll 
take its derivative and then divide by its magnitude to make it a unit vector. And so our claim is that this works. Uh, in other words, let's vaguely this works. In other words, this is perpendicular to the curve. In other words, what we're claiming, I'll draw a picture of it, but we have to prove it, which we will prove. What we're going to claim is that we've got this velocity, or we've got, say, t this way. That we know. What we're claiming here is that n is perpendicular. Now, I'm not saying it's on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. All, all I want to do here is claim that this is a 90-degree angle between these. That's the claim. So there's this question, how do we show that two things are perpendicular? Easiest way, take the dot product. The dot product is zero, we've done the job, right? So what we'll do is let's show that when I take n, we take n and we dot it with t, we get zero. So the way we'll do this is kind of sneaky. So let me clear off the left-hand side and then we'll work through the proof of this. This is kind of fun. I'm going to call this a proof. This is not a proof cost, but this is a really sort of easy proof to do. Right? So what do we know? We know that t itself is a unit vector, which means its magnitude is 1. Now, the magnitude, that's the same as the square root of the dot product with itself. which means when I dot it with itself, I also get one. Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take the derivative of both sides with respect to little t. Because right? remember, these big t's are really big t's of little t. Now, the right-hand side is a constant, so the derivative is zero. The left-hand side, I get to do the chain rule. So the chain rule says, Oh, sorry, not the chain rule, the product rule. Tells me this, right? Now, the dot product, it doesn't matter which way we dot. So the t prime dot t and the t dot t prime, these are both the same. So I'm going to write this as 2 t dot, oh, 2 t prime dot t is 0. So that tells us that t prime dot t is 0. Now, the normal vector... It's just a multiple of this. You can see that on the upper right. So what this tells us is at this point that T prime is perpendicular to T thus so is N. That's the end, done. So now we know, right, the practical upshot of this proof is that the normal vector is perpendicular to the curve. It does the job. So what I'll do is let me work through an example. I'll clear the screen off so we have everything available. We have the space and uh, we'll do an example. And then we'll come back to this, this issue about tangential and component and tangential and normal components of acceleration. So let's look at this example. Let's do um, r of t equals, say, t squared i plus tj. So for what it's worth, these problems, these are really good to do in, say, MATLAB, where you can do all these derivatives, because these things get really, really messy, really fast, even if the original problems look straightforward. And we'll see that with this one as we go. So for example, uh, there's a pretty simple vector value function, but it sort of explodes as you start to take derivatives. So first, let's find um, the tangent vector. So to do that, we take and the derivative, take the derivative over its magnitude. So derivative is easy. 
that's 2ti plus 1j over the magnitude of that. So magnitude, let me write in all the gory details here. It's the square root of 4t squared plus 1. Nice and easy. So I'm going to separate those because we have to take another derivative in a second. So t of t, the tangent vector, is usually not so bad. This is not the troubling one. The problem, of course, now is I need to do this sort of process again. So the tangent vector itself is done. Let me box that up. That's this. We can find that at certain points. You can plug in specific t's, whatever you want to do. Right. For n, we need to do it again. So the derivative, as you see, even though this wasn't so bad, the next derivative is kind of messy. right? So remember that n of t is the derivative of t over its magnitude. So let's do this in pieces here, right? So now very often though what happens is these simplify, but it's hard to see that from the get-go. So when I do the first derivative, the derivative of the i component, right, I need to use the quotient rule. So I do the derivative of the top times the second minus the top. So when we do the derivative of the bottom, rather, I'm going to get 1 half 4t squared plus 1 to the minus 1 half, use the chain rule, over the bottom squared. So bottom squared just removes the square root. That's just the i. And then the second one, um, I don't really need to use a quotient rule because I can think of this right here as just 4t squared plus 1 to the minus 1 half. So when we take its derivative, I'll get um, minus 1 half. Let me, uh, I'll write the results as a fraction though because it's a little nicer. Yeah. So we'll drop the exponent to minus 3 halves. In the numerator, we'll have the 1 half already the minus one half and the derivative of the inside. And that's our j. So I could take the magnitude of this. It's not terrible, but it's a little easier to tidy this up first. Let's simplify. So what we'll do here is for this first, for the i component, I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator, both of those, by the square root of 4t squared plus 1. So this becomes 2 times 4t squared plus 1. Here, the 2 and the 1 half cancel. So we're left with 8t squared. And since we're multiplying by 4t squared plus 1 to the 1 half, that cancels with the 4t squared plus 1 to the minus 1 half. And we're multiplying both the numerator and the denominator. So that picks up a little bit down there. And then this just becomes minus 4t over 4t squared plus 1, 3 halves, j. Now, simplifies a bit more because that first numerator is 8t squared plus 2 minus 8t squared. So that's just 2 over 4t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. This isn't so bad at the end of it all, but... It's certainly easy to do it in software and not make it so likely to make a mistake. So then what we do is we take the magnitude of this. This is the square root of the sum of the squares. So when we square the two individual ones here, we get 4 over 4t squared plus 1 cubed plus... 16t squared over 4t squared plus 1 cubed. This simplifies a bit because we can pull out a 4 from both of these terms. That becomes a 2. The numerator becomes 4t squared plus 1. The denominator 
is 4t squared plus 1 cubed. So we cancel the 4t squared plus 1, and we're just left with 2. And in the denominator, we have 4t squared plus 1 squared, and the square root cancels. We just get that. So finally, the normal vector in all its glory is the tangent vector derivative right there divided by this thing that we got right here. So in other words, um, we can write it, this will be kind of messy for a first step. I'll just write it like this. This is all divided by 2 over 4t squared plus 1. So when we divide this, we can multiply by the reciprocal. And then what happens is the the we now become dividing by the 2 and multiplying by 4t squared plus 1. So what happens is in the first term, the 2s cancel. In the denominator, we're simply left with 1 over 4t squared plus 1. And in the second term, 2 cancels with the 4t to leave a 2t. To leave a 2t. And so that. Sorry, small mistake in there. We're canceling a 4t squared plus 1, so we're left with a square root in both of those cases. So that, at the end of the day, is our n. So again, not the prettiest thing in the world, bunch of calculations, but that thing will be perpendicular to the curve. And again, you can plug in points, discover things, etc. So final thing to discuss here is to go back to the original point about the tangent and normal components of acceleration, because that's sort of where this becomes actually sort of useful in a meaningful way, because right now we just sort of have these, you know, these really icky calculations. So let me clear the screen off and then I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by the tangent and normal components of acceleration and then we'll give those formulas. So we'll say for uh, tangential and normal components of acceleration. So here's the idea, just sort of a really sim simplistic example. Suppose that you do something like you launch a rocket ship. We've got the ground here, and this rocket takes off and it follows a path like, you know, like this, because it's heading up into orbit. It goes this way. So at some point, the rocket is right here. And there are various, various forces acting on the rocket, right? In terms of acceleration, those are the things you worry about. Those are the g-forces, etc. And so there's a comp the acceleration breaks into two pieces. There's a certain amount of acceleration going this way, forward, and there's a certain amount of acceleration that's perpendicular. So in other words, just to, to say that clearly, um, some, meaning some part, some acceleration is in the direction of motion. Those are sort of like the g-forces you could think about that are pinning you into your seat, if you like. And then sum of the acceleration is perpendicular to motion. And this all comes into play in terms of rocket design, the thrusters, the stabilization, etc. So there's this looming question of like, well, how much of each? So what we'll do is we'll say this, we can write the following. We can write the acceleration. So the notation is a bit weird. I'm going to write this as a sub t, t bar plus a sub n, n bar. So what you see in this, this is a linear combination. It's a combination of a certain amount of t and a certain amount of n. Notice the, the lowercase, the a sub t and the a sub n, those are constants. And so what we're saying here, this is saying basically how many tangent vectors worth of force are there in the direction of motion. Right? So this is a constant or a scalar, if you like, that's indicating how 
how many T's there are. And um, in the, let's say in the direction of motion. Whereas the other one, this guy, this is a scalar indicating how many ends there are uh, perpendicular to the direction of motion, if you like. And the idea is that acceleration can be broken up this way. And so doing this helps us understand how the acceleration is acting on the vehicle, like whatever it happens to be, a rocket ship, a race car, anything that you like. Like the acceleration falls into two pieces. There's the piece that's perpendicular and the piece that's parallel or tangent and perpendicular, if you like. So there are various ways to, de to derive these formulas. I'm not going to necessarily go through these. I'm not going to go through these, but there are a bunch of different approaches. Right, so we'll say, there are a number of different formulas for a sub t and a sub n. Uh, there are two really easy ones. Let's say the two easiest are the following. These are the ones we'll use. So the, this guy, this a sub t, I'm going to give these proper names in a second. I should have ready. This is V dot A over the magnitude of V. This is the tangential component of acceleration. So that's a long phrase, but take a second to digest it, right? It's the, the part of the acceleration that's tangent, hence the tangential component of acceleration. And the other one, a sub n, this is a little more confusing. This is the cross product, v cross a, magnitude of the cross product over the magnitude of v. This is the normal component of acceleration, perpendicular. Again, it's not entirely obvious where these formulas come from, right? They come from, there are a variety of different ways you can do projections of acceleration, you can take acceleration, you can rewrite it in certain ways. There are a bunch of different approaches, which I'm not gonna overly worry about the derivations of these, but you shouldn't necessarily look at these and think that they necessarily look obvious. But you're certainly welcome to ask me and we can go through an explanation. But what I do wanna do is give you an example, just so you can, we can see what these numbers might mean. But again, both, both of these keep in mind, both of these are scalars. So let me um, clear the screen, go through an example, calculate some values, and, uh, and draw a picture just so we see. So for example, let's go back to a favorite of ours that we've seen a bunch. Let's do ti and t squared j, this is a parabola. I'm also gonna put a zero k in here. This isn't really necessary, but when we do a cross product, it'll be helpful to have all three listed. And again, just to remind you, this is the curve, which looks like this. And we're specifically going to look at certain, in a certain specific T. Let's examine at T equals two. So according to the formula, uh, we need V and we need A. So V of T, the velocity is one I plus two TJ plus zero K acceleration, derivative again, and we have to plug two in. So uh, because we're doing it at a certain point, it's easier to plug in two and then use the formulas than the reverse, right? So we might as well just do these. So V of two, this is one I plus four J plus zero K. A of two, is zero i plus two j plus zero k. So then we have our formulas. The tangential component was v 
and this is all at two. So I'm going to try and remember to put the twos in here. So if I dot these two, we get one times zero plus four times two is eight plus zero over the square root of 18. And, and then also we need um, the cross product. Actually, while we're at it, let's do that. So remember the way this works, if we hide the i's and we take the, the determinant, we get zero in this one, zero in the j component, and then two in the k component. If that's a bit fuzzy, we, may have, we haven't done a cross product in a little while, so you might want to go back and check that out. So then the normal component of acceleration, that's the magnitude of v of 2 cross uh, a of 2. The magnitude of v of 2. That's 4 over the square root of 18. Now just for reference, uh, this is approximately 1.89. This is approximately 0 0.94. But the interesting thing to see here is this first one is twice the second one. This guy is twice as large. So what's going on here if we draw a picture? Try and draw a slightly better picture. So at t equals 2, this thing is at 2 comma 4. So we've got this object that's traveling along this curve it goes through 1, 1, it goes through 2, 4, keeps going. At that instant, there are sort of two senses of acceleration, right? There's an acceleration that's forwards, and there's an acceleration that's sort of to the left here. And so what we're saying is, that, like, in the green direction, right? Acceleration... Um, is let's say in our case 1.89 approximately is 1.89 units long right it's uh let's say a t which is 8 over root 18 uh let's say multiples of t bar. We're over on the other side, we could say a is approximately 0 0.94 units long. It's a sub n, to 4 over root 18, multiples of n bar. So interestingly, what, like one thing we could say, like without finding the acceleration vector, etc. Now, just to be fair, right, we know the acceleration vector. Like we're not doing this to calculate a, right? If, we, if all we wanted to do was calculate a, we would look back and be like, well, this is kind of dumb because here it is right here. All right, so the reason for doing this is not to calculate a. The reason for doing this is to understand how it's decomposed. In other words, what it looks like, right? How it would feel. So... Like if this were a rocket ship or a race car or something, what we can say is we can say that the acceleration in the direction of travel is twice as much as the acceleration perpendicular to travel. All right, so here's like an intuitive way of thinking about it. The acceleration in the direction of motion is twice the acceleration uh, perpendicular to the direction of motion. So really it's about breaking down the acceleration so that we understand how it's decomposed and so what's physically happening to this object. So that's the end of 12.5. It's actually the end of the chapter for us. Um, so I'll just call it closed for that.